I have some bad news. You know I have daughters, four of them. One of them is a guilty criminal now. She wouldn't take a nap. She was guilty of resisting arrest. <gasps> Welcome back, team. All right. Lesson 16. We're doing good. Today, analyzing how plot events and character decisions develop theme. What is the theme of this story? Anyway, dogs. No, it's not a theme. Theme is the bigger issue, the, the things that this story is about that we could apply to other stories. We can say, oh, I see that theme in this other story. I see that theme in another story. It's not about Buck. The theme's not about Buck. So let's think about that today. What is the theme of this story? Uh, last time we learned some really interesting things about Buck. We began reading chapter four and uh, we analyzed how incidents in the text provide characters or provoke characters to make decisions and reveal insight into Buck's character. Basically, what this means is Buck caused things to happen, right? He refused to take any position but the lead position. And in doing that, he outlasted Francois and Perrault. And ultimately, who's in charge of that sled team? It's Buck, right? Because he made Francois and he made Perrault do what he wanted. Really interesting. Uh, very powerful um, character, very powerful character. So we did see how Buck provoked that uh, by getting Francois and Perrault to make him um, make him in charge. All right, today what we're going to do is we're going to finish reading chapter four. We're also going to trace the development of themes. That means how does a theme develop? How does it change over time? in the text and how they develop in relationship to the characters and plot. So fancy words. Basically we're asking, what is the point of this story? What is the deeper meaning of this story? The story is not about a dog pulling a sled and getting leadership. It's not. I mean, you could say, yes, on the surface, that's what it is, but it would not be a world famous book if it was just about how dogs pull sleds. There's something deeper that we can learn about humankind from this. There's something deeper we can learn about ourselves, about other people, and we're going to find out what that is. What you're going to need today is Call of the Wild by Jack London, pages 45 to 41, 51, 45 to 51, and page 37 of your blue notebook. I believe we started uh, one, possibly two of these rose last time. Uh, I don't know if we have two, maybe it's just one, but we're going to finish it off today. Okay. Get ready. Okay. Now I'm excited to get into chapter four. If you want to go ahead and join me, we are at page 45 down near, it's about two thirds of the way down. It says a Scotch half breed. Go ahead and turn to page 45 where it says a Scotch half breed. And while you're doing that, Listen to me while I kind of recap what happened last time. What happened last time is Buck took control of the sled team. They made record time. They beat all these records. Francois and Perrault became famous in the town because of their sled dogs. And ultimately, they decided to cash them in. They were famous. Their dogs were famous. So they sold them. They sold Buck and the team. And Francois and Perrault are gone for good. I don't know how you feel about that. I'm not a big fan of that. I was beginning to like Francois and Perrault because they understood Buck. You know, it's like they understood him, but now they're no longer in the story. So it's a bittersweet thing. Buck outgrew them. Okay. And we like to see our hero growing. But at the same time, those were great characters. They understood Buck. So here we are, page 45. Let's see who Buck was sold to. Okay. Here we go. A Scotch half-breed took charge of him and his mates, and in company with a dozen other dog teams, he started back over the weary trail to Dawson. 
paws, a Scotch half-breed. That means uh, he's a man from Scotland, and he's probably part Scottish, part French, or part Canadian, part Scottish, or something. He's half-breed. Uh, so, another foreigner. All right, let's continue. It was no light running now, nor record time, but heavy toil each day, with a heavy load behind. For this was the mail train, carrying word from the world to the men who sought gold under the shadow of the pole. So they're mail carriers, right? They're like mailmen. Um, and Buck, I think, he's not running as fast as before because they're not trying to make record time. They're pulling huge heavy load behind him full of mail. So this is really hard work. This is not like before, okay? Buck did not like it, but he bore up well to the work, taking pride in it after the manner of Dave and Solex, and seeing that his mates, whether they prided in it or not, did their fair share. It was a monotonous life. That means the same thing over and over and over. Mono meaning one, tone meaning a sound, monotone. Beep. Imagine that, monotone, one tone, monotonous, but it also means boring you'd get bored of that really fast if you heard that noise that's what monotonous means go ahead and look at that word monotonous and i want you to say it as you look at it monotonous monotonous it's a good word it was a monotonous life operating with machine-like regularity one day was very like another at a certain time each morning the cooks turned out Fires were built and breakfast was eaten. Then, while some broke camp, others harnessed the dogs, and they were underway in an hour or so before darkness, which gave warning of dawn. At night, camp was made. Some pitched the flies, others cut firewood and pine boughs for the beds, and still others carried water or ice for the cooks. Also, the dogs were fed. To them, this was the one feature of the day, though it was good to loaf around after the fish were eaten, after the fish was eaten for an hour or so with the other dogs, of which there were five score and odd. So it was like a hundred dogs. There were fierce fighters among them, but three battles with the fiercest brought Buck to mastery. What do you think that means? Three battles with the fiercest brought Buck to mastery. What did Buck do? He fought three of the fiercest dogs of those hundred, and now he's in charge. I'm telling you, Buck is a... Don't mess with Buck. He may be a uh, little farm dog, but he knows what he's doing. Uh, they brought Buck to mastery, so that when he bristled and showed his teeth, they got out of his way. Best of all, perhaps... He loved to lie near the fire, hind legs crouched under him, four legs stretched out in front, head raised, and eyes blinking dreamily at the flames. Sometimes he thought of Judge Miller's big house in the sun-kissed Santa Clara Valley, and of the cement shimmering tank, cement swimming tank, and Isabel, the Mexican hairless, and Toots, the Japanese pug. But oftener he remembered the man in the red sweater, the death of Curly, the great fight with Spitz, and the good things he had eaten or would like to eat. He was not homesick. The sunland was very dim and distant, and such memories had no power over him. Far more potent or powerful, far more potent were the memories of his heredity that means his genes and his um, forefathers. Far more potent were the memories of his heredity that gave things he had never seen before a seeming familiarity. The instincts, which were but the memories of his ancestors become habits, which had lapsed in later days and still later in him quickened and became alive again. 
Sometimes, as he crouched there, blinking dreamily at the flames, it seemed that the flames were of another fire, and that as he crouched by the other fire, he saw another and different man from the half-breed cook before him. This other man was shorter of leg and longer of arm, with muscles that were stringy and knotty, rather than rounded and swelling. The hair of this man was long and matted, and his head slanted back under it from the eyes. He uttered strange sounds, and seemed very much afraid of the darkness, into which he peered continually, clutching his hand, which hung midway between his knees and foot. A stick with a heavy stone made fast to the end. He was all but naked, a ragged and fire-scorched skin hanging part way down his back. Pause. What is going on here? I I'm sorry. What? What? Hold on. Let's look at this again. Where is Buck right now? If we go back up a paragraph, he's sitting in front of the fire, slowly blinking his eyes. And then he's remembering the Judge Miller's property. And then he's thinking about the horrible things he's seen, Curly's death and all that. And then it says at the beginning of the paragraph on 46, at the bottom of 46, sometimes as he crouched there in front of the fire, blinking dreamily at the flames, it seemed that the flames were of another fire. And then he sees a different man from the half-breed cook. And the man he sees has long arms, a hairy matted head. He's carrying a heavy stone tool between his legs. He's practically wearing no clothes. He's wearing skins on him. What is he doing? Is he actually seeing this person here or no? And I think if we look here... It says he's blinking dreamily at the flames. You've seen your dogs do this. If you have a dog, you've seen this. I'm slowly going to sleep with their eyes as they sit up. He's dreaming. He's dreaming. And as he's dreaming, he's seeing this very strange figure. You may have an idea of what this figure represents. Let's keep reading. Let's pick it up from he was all but naked. He was all but naked, which means he was, he was naked, except for... A tiny ragged fire scorched skin an animal skin probably hanging part way down his back but on his body there was much hair in some places across the chest and shoulders and down the outside of the arms and thighs it was matted into almost a thick fur okay so a practically naked guy with a bunch of fur on his body he did not stand erect but with trunk inclined forward from the hips, on legs that bent at knees. About his body there was a peculiar springiness or resiliency, almost cat-like, and a quick alertness, as of someone who lived in perpetual fear of things seen and unseen. Push pause there, halfway down on 47. What are we talking about here? He's describing a man. You, you probably get this. He, he's got thick hairy arms he's wearing practically nothing he moves around like an animal he's looking back and forth what's buck describing in his dream caveman caveman some kind of caveman right some kind of primitive man this is a really weird part of the book we're having a dream sequence we went from seeing dogs chasing other dogs dogs chasing rabbits dogs eating other dogs dogs eating rabbits you know, the power struggle between spits. And here we are. Buck is sleeping in front of a fire having a dream. What's Jack London doing here? He's inserting a random dream sequence to tell us about the theme of the book. This isn't completely random. What would be random if Buck was dreaming about, I don't know, unicorns and pigeons or something. But here we are. He's dreaming about a caveman, a primitive man. What does this have to do with the theme of the book? Gives us a clue. Hmm. Let's keep reading. Page 47, halfway down. 
at other times. At other times, this hairy man squatted by the fire with head between his legs and slept. On such occasion, his elbows were on his knees, his hands clasped above his head as though to shed rain by the hairy arms. And beyond that fire, in the circling darkness, Buck could see many gleaming coals, two by two, always two by two, which he knew to be the eyes of great beasts of prey. And he could hear the crashing of their bodies through the undergrowth and the noises they made in the night. And dreaming there by the Yukon bank with lazy eyes blinking at the fire, these sounds and sights of another world would make the hair to raise along his back and stand on end across his shoulders and up his neck till he whimpered low and suppressedly or growled softly and the half-breed cook shouted at him hey you buck wake up whereupon the other world would vanish and the real world come into his eyes and he would get up and yawn and stretch as though he had been asleep hard stop so he's having a dream about this primitive man and i think when we talk about well i'm gonna let you do it okay let's move on to the next slide we're going to analyze this little dream sequence here especially this bold part this is probably hard to see on your phone i just realized but let me read it and circle some keywords this other man was shorter of leg and longer of arms he's got short legs and long arms muscles that were stringy and knotty rather than rounded and swelling the hair of this man was long and matted his head slanted back under it from the eyes he uttered strange sounds <laughs> i think that's strange and he seemed very much afraid of the darkness into which he peered continually clutching his hand he's afraid of the darkness hmm a stick with a heavy stone made fast to the end so some kind of axe or hammer or something made of stone he was all but naked all but naked a ragged fire scorched skin hung partway down his back but his body uh but on his body was much hair all right he didn't stand erect from the trunk so he doesn't stand straight up he's hunched over hmm what is the meaning of this some kind of caveman what's going on here so let's turn to page 37 in your blue notebook give you a moment to get there pause if you need to all right page 37 in your blue notebook we're going to add buck's dream sequence to the left hand side of your incident chart again i i can't remember i'm sorry I can't remember if we already did this one and this one or basically wherever you have a blank on that chart do this okay so maybe it's right here wherever you have the first blank summarize that dream sequence what happens in the dream sequence and then on the right hand side observations and analysis related to what themes or central ideas this suggests what's the theme here you're going to put the theme right here. Can I give you a couple hints? We're talking about a primitive man. We've seen this word primitive repeated several times in the novel. What's the title of the novel? Call of the Wild. Call of the Wild. Something about wildness. Like we can know the theme of the book for sure. There's something to do with this word wild because it's in the title. Is Buck keep becoming more or less wild? More wild. This man he saw in his dream, would you say this man is more or less wild? He's more wild, right? We talked last time about the word motif, okay? Sets of symbols that repeat themselves to get home a point. What about this theme of wildness? We see this motif of wildness going on. It's happening in Buck, it's happening in this dream. It's interesting it's interesting so what do you think the theme is here I'll leave it to you go ahead and answer that question do your best with it 
Um, check in with me or your neighbor if you have any questions. Um, pause the video here until you're done. Welcome back. Good job on the theme. We're going to pick it up at page 48. It was a hard trip. And then we're going to read all the way to the end of chapter 4. Go ahead and follow along as I read, and we're going to find out a little bit more about Buck's new job. And I will be straight up with you. This is a little bit of a bummer, this chapter. I mean, we lost Francois and Perrault, and, and you're going to see. It's going to be okay, though. Here we go. 48. <clears throat> it was a hard trip with the mail behind them, and the heavy work wore them down. They were short of weight and in poor con condition when they made Dawson. That's the city they were going to. And it should have had a 10 days or a week's rest at least. But in two days, they dropped down the Yukon Bank from the days uh, from the barracks loaded with letters for the outside the dogs were tired the drivers grumbling and to make matters worse it snowed every day this meant a soft trail greater friction on the runners and heavier pulling for the dogs yet the drivers were fair through it all and did their best for the animals each night the dogs were attended to first. They ate before the drivers ate, and no man sought his sleeping robe till he had seen to the feet of the dogs he drove. Still, their strength went. Since the beginning of the winter, they had traveled 1,800 miles dragging sleds the whole weary distance, and 1,800 miles will tell upon life of the toughest. Buck stood it, keeping his mates up to their work and maintaining discipline, though he too was very tired. Billy cried and whimpered regularly in his sleep each night. <laughs> Joe was sourer than ever, and Solex was unapproachable, blindside or other side. But it was Dave who suffered most of all. Something had gone wrong with him. He became more morose, that means uh, depressed. He had become more morose and irritable. And when camp was pitched, at once made his nest, where his driver fed him. Once out of the harness and down, he did not get on his feet again till harness up time in the next morning. Sometimes, in the traces, when jerked by a sudden stoppage of the sled, or by straining to start it, he would cry out with pain. The driver examined him, but could find nothing. All the drivers became interested in his case. They talked it over at mealtime, and over their last pipes before going to bed. And one night, they held a consultation. He was brought up from his nest to the fire and was pressed and prodded till he cried out many times. Something was wrong inside, but they could locate no broken bones, could not make it out. <clears throat> By this time, Kazer Bar was reached. He was so weak that he was falling repeatedly in the traces. The Scotch half-breed called a halt and took him out of the team, uh, making the next dog, Solex, fast to the sled. His intention was to rest Dave, letting him run free behind the sled. Sick as he was, Dave resented, that means hated, Dave resented being taken out grunting and growling while the traces were unfastened, and whimpering broken-heartedly when he saw Solex in the position he had held and served so long. For the pride of trace and trail was his, and sick unto death he could not bear that another dog should do his work. 
When the sled started, he floundered in the soft snow alongside the beaten trail, attacking Solex with his teeth, rushing against him and trying to thrust him off into the snow so uh, on the other side, striving to leap inside his traces and get between him and the sled, and all the while whining and yelping and crying with grief and pain. The half-breed tried to drive him away with the whip, but he paid no heed to the stinging lash, and the man had not the heart to strike harder. Dave refused to run quietly on the trail behind the sled, where the going was easy, but continued to flounder alongside in the soft snow, where the going was most difficult, till exhausted, then he fell, and lay where he fell, howling lugubriously, what? Lugubriously. Okay, look at that word. Lugubriously. Again, bottom of page 49, it's like like fourth word up, fourth line up. Lugubriously. That means like mourning out of sadness of death. Like very sad. He was howling lugubriously as the long train of sleds churned by. The last remnants of his strength, he managed to stagger along behind till the train made another stop. When he floundered past the sleds to his own, where he stood alongside Solex, his driver lingered a moment to get a light for his pipe from behind, uh, from the man behind. Then he returned and started his dogs. They swung out on the trail with the remarkable lack of exertion. They turned their heads uneasily and stopped in surprise. The driver was surprised too. The sled had not moved. He called his comrades to witness the sight. Dave had bitten through both of Solek's traces and was standing directly in front of the sled in his proper place. He pleaded with his eyes to remain there. The driver was perplexed, that means confused. His comrades talked of how a dog could break its heart through being denied the work that killed it and recalled instances they had known where dogs too old for the toil or injured had died because they were cut out of the traces. Also, they held it a mercy since Dave was to die anyway, that he should die in the traces, heart easy and content. Pause in the middle of that paragraph. <clears throat> Dave's not well. What's killing Dave? You could say some kind of injury inside of him. We don't know what it is. Nobody knows what it is, but something inside him is not working properly. But really what's killing him? The work is killing him, but not being able to pull the sled is also killing him. He's He's got so much pride. You know, he's got so much love for this job that he can't quit. He doesn't want to quit. doesn't matter how much pain he's in. He doesn't want to stop. And his owners are like, hey, he's going to die. Let him die happy. Put him back on the sled. So let's see what happens. We're just almost exactly in the middle of the page with the words, so he was. So he was harnessed in again, and proudly he pulled as of old, though more than once he cried out involuntarily uh, from the bite of his inward hurt. Several times he fell down and was dragged in the traces, and once the sled ran upon him so that he limped thereafter on one of his hind legs. But he held out till camp was reached, when his driver made a place for him by the fire. Morning found him too weak to travel. At harness-up time, he tried to crawl to his driver. By compulsive efforts, he got on his feet, staggered and fell. 
Then he wormed his way forward slowly toward where the harnesses were being put up on his mates. He would advance his four legs and drag up his body with a sort of hitching movement. When he would advance his four legs and hitch ahead again for a few more inches. His strength left him. And the last his mates saw of him, he lay gasping in the snow and yearning toward them. But they could hear him mournfully howling till they passed out of sight beyond a belt of river timber. Here the train was halted. The Scotch half-breed slowly retraced his steps to the camp they had left. The men ceased talking. A revolver shot rang out. The man came back hurriedly. The whips snapped. The bells tinkled merrily. The sleds churned along the trail. But Buck knew, and every dog knew, what had taken place behind the belt of river trees. I'm sorry I'm reading this story to you. <laughs> I'm sorry. All right, guys. So again, we're talking about theme. And this whole incident with um, Dave really brings up some important themes in the book. And so what I'd like to do is discuss these answers, um, citing textual evidence. Um, there's not a great place to do this in your workbook, but we're going to try on page 36. Okay, so blue notebook, page 36. I'm going to write it here. B N 36. And then uh, the text from our book, Call of the Wild, put CW here. Call of the Wild, we're going to start at page 49, the bottom, okay? So the last four paragraphs, I'd like you to re-examine those from Call of the Wild, read the last four paragraphs again, but read them with these questions in mind, okay? The first question is, like, how, how does the owner show compassion to Dave and mercy? What do they do to show compassion and mercy to Dave? The next question so you can number this number one in your blue notebook, okay? Whoop. Number one. Number two, what does Dave's desire to remain in the harness show about his character? What do we learn about him as a person? You say as a dog. Yeah, but I mean, yes, they're dogs, but they're also supposed to tell us about humans, about people. Um, what can we learn about his character? Because he doesn't want to give it up. What does that tell us about him? And then number three, what themes about the wild does Dave's death convey? If you're not sure what theme is, you should have figured that out in like fifth grade. If you don't know what theme is, look it up right now and don't ever forget again because theme is what it's all about. So what themes about the wild does Dave's death convey? Use evidence for these. You don't have to write a size ick. Don't do a size ick. Just write one, two, three. Write a sentence. Provide a little quote. All right? Good. Get it done. Pause the video until you're done with it. All right, so let's jump over to uh, Blue Notebook, page 37, to summarize these incidences. So... Record the incident of Dave's death on your incident chart. Again, I, I'm not exactly where you're sure. Maybe we have three done, maybe something like that. But basically, find a blank spot. Even if it's at the bottom of the page where there's not a box, make your own little box, okay? Make your own little box here if you need to. And uh, you're going to write about Dave's death here in this box, okay? Summarize what happened. What are the events that led to his death? And then finally, uh, human and animal relationships. Write your analysis of the themes of the incident they develop related to human animal relationships and the nature of the wild. So what does his death tell us about the way humans interact with dogs out there? And what does this tell us about the wild? Okay. 
get it done. Pause the video here. Great job. I like it. You're doing good. In this lesson, you finished reading and discussing Chapter 4, Call of the Wild. You also traced the development of key themes in the text and how they are developed in relationship in relation to the plot and characters. Theme is a key idea here, a key word. Themes. There are a lot of themes going on in this book, and I look forward to talking to each of you about what you think the theme of this book is. It's a cool book. Very cool book. Um, thank you. I'll see you next time.